Hey guys, Micah here with ebikeschool.com, and today I'm going to be showing you how to build odd-shaped lithium batteries. Basically, batteries that aren't rectangular and need to fit in sort of a weird shape. Now, today I'm going to be building a battery that will fit into this bicycle bag. This is going to go on my wife's e-bike, and it's designed to fit under the seat. So I need to make sort of a weird egg-shaped battery that's going to fit nicely in this bag. And to do that, I'm going to follow the steps that I've outlined in my book, DIY Lithium Batteries. If you don't have my book, that's fine. You know, you can follow along with the video and I'm going to show you the parts that I'm using. But if you do have my book or you want to pick it up, it'll show you everything you need to know about building lithium batteries. Now, the first thing I need to know is which cells I'm going to use. And because I've got this pretty small bag here, I want to make sure that I'm using battery cells that have the most capacity. So right now there's a sort of a tie in the market for the cell with the highest capacity. And that's a tie between the Sanyo 18650GA cells and the LG MJ1 cells. Both of these have very similar ratings, um, you know, basically the same ratings. They're both rated for uh, 10 amp maximum discharge. They're both 3.5 amp hours or 3500 milliamp hours. You know, they're the same size, the same weight. They're basically all the same ratings. The one difference is the cycle life rating, where the LG MJ1 cells are rated for about um, 400 cycles before they get down to 80% of their original capacity. While if you look at the spec sheet for the uh, Sanyo 18650 GA cells, uh, they're only rated for about 180 cycles or so before they get down to 80% capacity. So they have about half the cycle life. Um, the other thing is LG MJ1 cells are just a little bit cheaper. So I'm going to go with the LG MJ1 cells just because they're more economical and they're going to last longer. And I'm going to get mine from Vruzen.com, um, obviously because like you guys know I'm part of the Vruzen team. So now we need to move on to our next step, which is going to be planning the layout of our cells. Alright, so I normally like to design my batteries on the computer here, but because I'm doing sort of an odd shape, I think it's going to be easier just to draw it out on paper. Um, so I'll demonstrate how I do that here. I'm just going to start with you know, a notebook here and I'm going to take my uh, bag that I want to put this battery in and I'm going to trace out the outline of this bag on the paper. Now this isn't going to be perfect, but I want to get it as close as I can. Now, like I said, not perfect, but pretty close. And now I'm just going to start laying out my cells on here and just figuring out how many I can fit in this shape. So I'm just going to lay out my cells and we'll see what fits. I'm going to stay, I'm trying to stay within the line um, with a good margin just because I know my tracing is not perfect here. There, so I think that basically fits our shape and I was able to get uh, 30 cells in here, so this is perfect. Because I'm going to be building a 36 volt battery here. And so 36 volts, that means I'm going to be building a 10S battery. So for 10S I'm going to have sets of 10 cells. And so if I've got 10 sets of cells times 3 cells, it's going to give me a total of 30 cells. See how that easy math works out? So that's perfect, I was able to get 30 cells in here. Um, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna remove each of these cells and I'm gonna draw exactly where it was on my battery shape here. And that way I can draw out my connections next. Now you'll notice this is not perfect, but I'm just trying to get them as close as, uh, as, close as I reasonably can. All right, so there are my 30 cells. Now I'm going to divide them into modules of three cells each. So this will be where my connections are being made. I'll start here. This will be my first group of three cells. This makes a nice second group. Third group. Call this group four, group five, group six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. All right, now let's decide which ends are positive and negative. Let's say we'll start down here. This will be minus one. So that'll make this end of this group positive. And we're just gonna alternate every group. So it'll be negative side up, positive up. Negative up, and this will be positive side up. Negative, positive. And just for reference, um, on these cells, the positive end is the one where you can see the exposed vent holes here, and it's got the white strip. Negative is just the end that's the bare bottom of the cell. All right, so that was positive, negative, 
positive. This will be negative, and this last one will be positive. That'll be positive 10. And we go ahead and uh, write these out just so that uh, just so that we can see. So this will be positive 10 minus 9, positive 8 minus 7. So it'll be positive 6 minus 5. So it'll be positive. Four. This will be minus three. Positive two. This will be minus one. All right. So now we've got the design of our battery. Now I could have done this battery using the Vruzen caps, like um, you see me do in previous videos, where they just snap together, and I don't need to um, spot weld them or solder them, because as we all know, soldering these cells is bad. But I want to fit as many cells as I can in this bag, and those vrus and caps just add a little bit more space. So I'm not going to use those, I'm just going to hot glue these together and spot weld them. Also, you know, people ask me all the time if hot gluing cells is okay. This is something I talk about in chapter 9 of my book. Um, you know, you can use these uh, plastic connectors, either the black ones or the vrus and ones, uh, to hold your cells together. A lot of people say this is going to give you a lot more cooling. Um, that's not really true if you're going to be sealing up your battery in some kind of case or heat shrink because at that point no air is getting in so you're just creating an oven in there. Um, so there's really no difference in cooling between these and with hot gluing your cells if you're going to be closing up your battery in heat shrink like we will. Um, and hot gluing it's really not a problem with the extra heat from the hot glue. Uh, it's you know a very small amount of heat in a low spot and it cools very quickly. So you're not transferring a lot of heat through the can of the cell there. So I use hot gluing a lot when I build my batteries, but this is something you can read about more in chapter 9 of my book. Alright, so now let's get started putting our, uh, the first part of our battery together. I'm just going to do these first uh, two cell groups here. I'm going to start by hot gluing just the first group. So let's see, we're just going to take one group here. Alright, so there we've got our minus one group. Now we're going to put three more cells on there. All right, and now we've got our first three rows here of cells. So let's do one more row. All right, now we've got the first part of our battery glued up here, and we need to decide where we're gonna put our series connections, because these first connections we drew, these are our parallel connections. Now this is the negative one terminal of our battery right here. This is basically the uh, negative terminal of the entire pack. So we're not gonna connect these two groups. We're gonna start by connecting plus two and minus three, because these two are gonna be connected on the bottom side here. So we'll start up here, and here we can make one connection between each of these cells. And this is the ideal way to do it. You know, we could have just done one connection in the middle here and forgotten about these two, but then we would have had all the current flowing through just one spot. So when you can, it's best to connect all the cells in a group, like we've done here. That way you spread out the current flow and you have three different paths for the current to flow, one on each of these cells in the group. All right, so we're going to skip the connection from minus 3 to plus 4. That's, again, going to be on the other side of the battery. So we're going to connect from plus 4 to minus 5. So it looks like we can do and continue this one to here. And we can connect from here and here, all right? And so we've got one cell that's hanging out over here. And uh, what we want to do is we just want to strengthen the connection here and just beef it up a little bit. So we might put an extra connection here, all right? So now we're going to skip from minus 5 to plus 6. We're going to go from plus 6 to minus 7. So here we can go from here and connect here, and we can connect here. And again, we've got one cell that's sort of hanging out here. We might just beef him up with one more connection here. Uh, and then we're going to skip minus 7 to plus 8, and plus 8 is going to go to minus 9. So we're going to continue this connection here. We can connect here. And we can do one more here. And again, we've got this one cell that's sort of hanging out here. He's not connected to the next group. So we might just beef him up with one more connection here. The minus 9 is not going to connect to plus 10. It's going to connect on the bottom side of the battery there. Now, we need to make sure that we're using enough nickel strip. So we want to check the size of the nickel strip we're using and how much current we need to pass. Now, I know from my battery, I'm going to be using it on an e-bike that pulls 15 amps. So I want to make sure that whatever nickel I'm using, it can, can support 15 amps. 
So I'm going to be using, let's find it here, I'm going to be using nickel that's 0.15 millimeters by 7 millimeters. You can find this table on um, page 55 of my book. It's also on Endless Sphere. Um, and uh, you can also just use it right here. So this is the nickel I'm using, 0.15 millimeter by 7 millimeters. What I find is that it can carry an optimal amount of 4.7 amps. It's acceptable to carry up to 7, and on the high end you can go up to about 9.5 amps, but we want to try to keep it down here. So let's aim for about 5 amps, because that's just about optimal and it's certainly within the acceptable range. So uh, if we're going to pull 5 amps from each cell, then we're going to have three cells, each living five amps, giving 15 amps. That means we need three connections of nickel, right? Because if we want three connections, each one pulling five amps, that's five times three is 15 amps, and that's the, uh, the amount of amps that my controller is going to pull. So in this case, using this 0.15 millimeter by seven millimeter nickel, I can use three connections here. So now if we go back and we look at my battery, we can see, all right, so I've got here, three connections. Where'd my pencil go? Here we go. So I've got three connections here, one, two, three, and this is going to be perfectly fine. Uh, on the next set, I've got one, two, three, and I'm just going to double up this connection here so that we make sure that we've got enough um, you know, current flow coming from here so we can pass the current from this last cell. So each one of these connections, I want to make sure I have at least three pieces of nickel making the series connection. All right, now let's go spot weld. I'm going to start with the parallel connections on this first group here. And you can see that I'm using a Sunco spot welder. I have the link to where I got it in the description below this video. There's a lot of different spot welders out there though, so you can use pretty much any one you want. They're all more or less the same. Some people solder these cells as well, but that's not really good for the cells, so I don't recommend using a soldering iron. Alright, let's speed things up. From here I just basically followed my original plan there for my notebook and spot welded on the parallel and then the series connections gluing more cells onto the battery as I move down the pack. And so now I have my pack all spot welded together in a shape that matches my original diagram. At this point, I can check to make sure I did the connections correctly by double checking that the voltage is approximately the 36 volts that I'm looking for. And now it's time to add our BMS. If you have my book, go ahead and open it up to page 95. And here you can see a diagram of a BMS. Here's the BMS we're gonna use, very similar to one in the diagram. And the way this works is we're going to start with our B minus pad, which is here in the corner. Actually, it says B minus here, but it's covered up by our solder blob. I think I took this BMS off of another project. In this corner, we've got our P minus. This is going to go out to whatever device that we're powering. And then we've got our C minus pad here, and this is going to go out to the charger. And both of these are going to be the negative um, ends of those connectors. So it's going to be the negative connector for the discharge and the negative connector for the charge. Now, if you go to the next page, you can see sort of a schematic of how we're going to wire this up. Now in this case, same idea, same BMS. We're going to start with our B minus here in the corner, and this is going to go to the negative end of the battery, the negative one terminal. Next, we're going to run our P minus and our C minus all the way outside of the battery. So the C minus goes to the charger, and the P minus is going to go out to our device, which is in our case going to be a e-bike speed controller. Now the uh, positive end of both the charge and the discharge don't connect to the BMS at all. Those are going to connect to the plus 10 end of the battery, so the positive terminal of the battery. And then lastly, we're going to connect all of our little balance wires here, all these little rainbow colored wires. Each one of these is going to go to the positive end of each cell. Now here we've got 10 balance wires and 10 cells, so they each go to the positive end. In some cases you'll have 11 balance wires for 10 cells, or you'll just have one more than the number of cells. In that case, the first one will go to the negative end of the first cell, and then they'll all connect to the positive ends. But we've got 10 wires here, so it's very easy. 10 wires, each one goes to the positive end of each cell. I like to add a small piece of foam between my BMS and the pack, both for vibration dampening and just to keep the two parts electrically insulated from each other. Hot glue is a fine way to attach them. Next, I'll solder my B- wire to the BMS, and then the other end to the negative terminal of my battery. Notice that I'm soldering on the nickel strip between the cells and not directly above a cell. That helps reduce the amount of heat that gets transferred to the cells. Now I can start soldering on my balance wires on this side of the pack. Here I'm connecting the plus two balance wire, then the plus four wire, then plus six, and then plus eight. I'll save plus ten to do after I connect the positive charge wire at that same location. Now when I flip the battery over, I can connect the balance wires on the plus one, plus three, plus five, plus seven, 
and the plus nine terminals. Now I'll use this neat Rosenberger magnetic connector that I got from lunacycle.com for my discharge connector. This will be much easier for my wife to connect to her bike than her old Anderson power pole connectors that she was always complaining to me about. I stripped the wires and I'll connect the negative wire to the P- pad on the BMS and then the positive wire to the plus 10 terminal of the pack, again soldering between the cells on the nickel strip. At the same spot, I'll then connect the positive wire of my charger connector and lastly I'll connect the plus 10 balance wire on top of those. I'll connect the negative end of my charge connector to the C- pad on the BMS and of course I'll cover the camera with my hand while I do it. Then I'll just use some capped on heat resistant tape to hold down the wires and keep them a bit more organized. Before heat shrinking, I like to use a thin one millimeter sheet of craft foam to cover the battery and create a small layer of vibration and bump protection. So now it's time to start sealing our battery and heat shrink. Now if you open my book up to page uh, 100 or chapter 12, we can start looking at the heat shrink section. Now, when you have square batteries or rectangular batteries, it's so much easier to heat shrink them because you can just use a single piece and it just wraps right around the corners. When you get to these odd shapes, that's where it gets a little trickier. So uh, one of the things I describe in my book is that the best way to do this is to use multiple pieces of different sizes of heat shrink, um, you know, cascading down the, the shape of sort of the slope of the battery, and that way they can lock into each other. Another good way to do it is to use different pieces at 90 degree angles. So you, know, you start with one underneath, then you put one at 90, then you put another one at 90, another one on top of that, getting bigger and bigger. And that way as you go, they lock each other in at 90 degree angles. We're gonna do sort of a combination of that on this shape, just cause it's a bit of this weird sort of egg shape to it. For these weird shaped batteries, it's helpful to have a few different sizes of heat shrink. I'll start with a fairly small size that will cover just the tip of the battery. Then I'll use a larger size that covers most of the battery and helps lock in that tip piece. Then I'll use a really large size at a 90 degree angle to the first two that will lock all of these pieces together and it will also cover the ends. I begin by measuring out and cutting the smallest piece of heat shrink and making sure that it can slide as far up the battery as possible. Then I'll cut the medium piece so that it can cover most of the battery, including that first piece. I'm just gonna use a strong hair dryer here on the high setting but you can also use a heat gun on a lower medium setting. Now the tip piece is in place, but it could still fairly easily slide off the front of the battery, so we need to add our next larger piece on top of it. At this point, I also want to include a little pole handle to make it easier for my wife to slide the battery out of the bag. So I'll measure out a piece of nylon webbing and then sew it into a loop. Next, I'll use the largest piece of heat shrink and slide it on 90 degrees to the first two. This will cover the ends of the battery and lock the first two pieces in place. Next, I'll glue the carry strap to the front of the battery, cover it with a scrap of heat shrink, and then slide another medium-sized piece over it and shrink that in place. That last piece of heat shrink just makes everything look prettier. So now we've finished sealing up our battery, and if we're lucky, or good, either one, it should slip right in our bag. And there we go, perfect. Slips right in, we've got ourselves a nice little compact 36 volt, 10 and a half amp hour battery with cute little carry handles so you can pull it right out. Uh, and it wasn't that difficult, was it? I hope this video helped show you how to build a battery. Um, if you found it interesting, I'd love it if you'd give it a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to my channel if you want to get more videos. And uh, oh, one last thing. Uh, time to announce the winner of last week's book giveaway. And remember, just comment in this video if you want to win, and the winner from last week of one free book was Benjamin Gonzalez. So congratulations, Benjamin. Um, feel free to send me a private message here on YouTube. You can uh, let me know which book you'd like, either my DIY Lithium Batteries book that I used in this video, or my other book, The Ultimate Do-It-Yourself E-Bike Guide. Uh, send me a message, let me know which one you want, and again, everybody ask me your questions in the comments below or just comment and say hi, and I will choose one random commenter from this video to win a book in my next video. Alright, thanks for watching everybody.